Good evening, everybody. I am the founder and executive director of the West Island Cancer Wellness Center, and my name is Debbie Magwood. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a, just a little brief history of why we're doing these Zoom into wellnesses. Um, our primary reason is to help advocate the whole idea of the importance of cancer wellness. And for people to truly understand that having cancer is a whole body experience. And in order to combat the disease efficiently and effectively, uh, we passionately believe in this whole person approach. And what this approach includes is addressing our physical needs, such as our comfort, pain, relief, symptoms, nutrition, activities, our informational needs, which refers to like resources in the community, our psychological and emotional needs, um, which obviously is our emotional well-being, our social needs, family, social networking, community, our spiritual needs, such as hope, the need to belong, meaning, purpose, um, existential concerns, our practical needs, you know, daily living, um, uh, support with uh, rides, and finally, our systemic needs, um, which we really, when we refer to our systemic needs, we're talking about uh, how to navigate the medical system. The research confirms that if we look at our wellness based on all these trajectories of care, all these needs, and we try to balance them all out, um, it will in some way, shape or form help uh, the, uh, the healing process. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce briefly our speaker. Uh, our speaker's name is Dr. Anita Metra. And she's going to be speaking to us today about what to say when you don't know what to say, navigating challenging conversations. Welcome, Anita. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Anita, we're just going to be uh, chit-chatting back and forth. I'm going to be asking you a whole bunch of questions. Um, but let's just start off maybe by telling us a little bit about you. Sure. So, I have a bit of a mix in terms of different hats that I wear. Uh, my primary role right now is I'm the Director of Education at the Teresa Delar Palliative Care Residence, also in the West Island. Previous to that, I was a co-director at the McGill University Health Center of the uh, Psychosocial Oncology Program, where we worked with cancer patients from diagnosis uh, through um, through remission or through bereavement, and we weren't limited to patients. We had we saw so many families there as well. Um, I also wear a hat of a psychotherapist. I'm at the Jewish a day a week as well in their Copland family therapy um, department. And I have a private practice in the West Island as well, uh, where I see couples, families, kids and adolescents. Um, my passion really is, is family members and caregivers. And the majority of my career has been in oncology. Wow, I wonder if you actually sleep or have any time off in between. <laughs> That this was supposed to be my nap time, but you asked me to speak instead. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. So this is obviously an, an extremely important topic. Um, can you tell us why you think it's an important topic? I think communication is so important because what's not said can sometimes lead to, to distress, frustration, confusion, regret, and even what's said if not said effectively, can lead to the same sentiments of confusion, regret, uh, and stress. And the hope is always that what you say, um, that the intent is understood and received in the way that you wish it. Oftentimes we see in oncology or in other chronic illnesses that the intent or what you wanna say doesn't quite land in the way that you want it. And so for that reason, um, we do a lot of workshops on, on, uh, on communication. Um, the research actually shows that if families can communicate well with each other, um, then there's less distress in, in, uh, in, the, in the couple dynamic uh, overall. And so there's a lot of research, not just clinical experience that, that highlights that. Mm. You, you made a really important point in, in what you said. You, you referenced to the fact that this isn't just 
um, you know, what you're going to be speaking about today isn't just something for cancer patients, that actually other people who have other diseases and, and probably to a certain extent, all of us can, can learn from this topic tonight. Yeah, and I think my running joke is I, I do communication for a living. I work in couple therapy, right? And, and so learning what to say uh, effectively. Um, there's a principle in communication that we use with the acronym EAR, EAR, um, where we talk about communication that really focuses on empathy. Uh, that's the E piece, assertiveness, the confidence in saying what you want to say. And the R is for respect. How do I say what I want to say in a manner that's respectful to the other person? And so that is definitely not limited to, to oncology or to illness, um, pretty much to all our, our communication uh, that we have. If, if you can use those principles or keep those in mind, it, it just means that communication can be more effective. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. What do you think is the reason why um, people often don't know what to say? I think there's a range of different reasons. I think the first is discomfort. Um, not understanding the other person's experience, um, feeling that what you might say might be the wrong thing, I think is often what people, um, people are worried about, being uninformed about the illness of the person's experience also often creates some kind of hesitation uh, and really the fear of making a mistake. Just saying something that lands the wrong way and not knowing how to take back sometimes I think is also um, a real reason. But I think, and that's why I'm hoping that when people leave this talk today, they'll recognize that you will not always know what to say, but that's okay too. Mm. Are there certain things that people say that are just frankly unhelpful? like not helpful. How much time do we have? Yes. <laughs> um, I'll never forget. I had a nursing student when I was teaching at McGill uh, when it was the palliative care unit and she went in to the patient and I think the patient shared something and she said, uh, I completely understand. And the woman said to her, you understand? Are you, are you dying too? And the poor student left there in tears, but, but I, I think the key piece or what is often the wrong thing to say is that you understand the experience of the other person. So things like, I understand, uh, sharing your own experience. I remember when that happened to me. Here's what I went through. While the intent can be good, it doesn't mean it overlaps or even resonates with the person that you're speaking with. You will beat this. Again, intent is good. It's meant to be optimistic. I imagine it's meant to instill some degree of hope. But again, you don't know how it will land or resonate with the patient, especially if you don't know where on the trajectory they are. You don't know how sick they are. You don't know how much they're sharing with you. So the you will beat this may or may not land in the way that you intend. Um, my personal favorite is stay positive. Don't worry everything will be okay. And so what that does almost immediately is it validates the person's experience. It minimizes whatever distress they might be having, whatever thoughts or confusion they might having, almost by saying you don't have the right to, do, to feel that. Don't feel that. Stay positive. As if staying positive can somehow erase or fix the situation. I'm not saying that the patient can't be positive, and, and that's, you know, we can certainly look at that but I'm saying it's probably not the best thing to say. Mm -hmm. um, relativity theory often doesn't work well. I know someone who had the exact same diagnosis and they beat this. My sister's cousin's wife's daughter had that. And you know what? Turned out okay. Not always the most effective thing because the experience is so individual and so unique to the person who's experienced it. There is nobody else who's having that experience except for the person with that diagnosis and with that illness trajectory. The other one, um, this must be really hard for you. That's a tricky one because it, it really does seek to empathize. It seeks to kind of open a door um, for some sharing to say, you know, I, I get it, this must be challenging, let's talk about it. But you don't know that it's really hard. Uh, you know, and we can look at strategies on how to flip that instead saying something like, tell me what this has been like. 
is much more open-ended and puts the ball in the other person's court to actually tell you what it's been like. Oh, you know what? It hasn't been that hard uh, versus assuming that must be really hard. That must be really difficult. Your family must be devastated. Those are all assumptions um, that again, it may or may not resonate. Um, tying into, you know, stay positive is the hang in there. Hang in there. It'll be okay. Um, Sometimes patients are just tired. They don't necessarily want to hang in there in the moment that you're telling them to hang in there. Um, I could probably go on, but I, I, I think those are really the key ones that are, that mm. are up right I, now. I, I'd love it too if if some of the you know the seventy some odd people we have with us tonight, if you have a couple of doozies that people have said to you, just write it in the chat, and uh, we can uh, express those uh, throughout the the hour that we're together. Um, I think you, you touched on also something that's really important that people can also have a tendency to say what they think they would want to hear. Um, you know, as, as, a, as an example of um, best, their best practice. So it's only that they take it from their own perspective instead of, you know, listening to the other person's perspective. And, and you touched on that a little bit. Could you maybe just go on a little bit further on that? I think it ties into the fact that everyone's experience is, is so unique. Um, we're who we are is based on our values, our beliefs, our past experiences with illness, with cancer, with someone else we might know. So what we need in the moment, again, cannot be what, sorry, what a, what a patient needs in the moment. It's not going to be what I need in the moment. And again, even with best intent saying that, you know what, I'm someone who really likes information. I really need to know all about the illness. And so sending my friend, perhaps with a diagnosis, all these great research articles may or may not be what that person needs. And it goes back to tell me what it is that I can do to be helpful. Tell me what you need uh, are more effective strategies than assuming what the person needs. Um, you may be right. Most oftentimes you're not. And again, because who I am as a person will be who I am as a patient. And that's going to be different than what someone else's experience is. Mm. We have a, a couple of doozies up here. Okay. So someone wrote, you look great. You don't look sick at all. Nice. Um, there's a, there's a, a doctor uh, who apparently uses the term whatever. Um, <laughs> do you really have cancer? You haven't lost your hair. So I guess that there, there, you know, the assumption here is that there is a lot of um, assumptions that uh, people run by when they're making some some statements. Yeah, and that goes back to sort of your first, you know, question: Why do people not? Why are people so hesitant? It's because they're uninformed, uh, and that lack of information or insight really leads them to say things. Mm. Um, don't fit. And you said something interesting about the, the whatever doctor. Um, you know, I've been in healthcare my entire career, and we actually run workshops um, at the palliative care residence called Serious Illness Conversations, geared to healthcare professionals on how to have difficult conversations, believe it or not. Um, so interestingly, I'm talking, you know, you know, to an audience, maybe of mostly patients or, or family members with some healthcare professionals, but we actually have to train our medical professionals on how to have conversations um, about oncology and about serious illness uh, so that it lands well with the patients as well. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of bounce this from what not to say to what to say and um, ask you, Anita, what are, what are some of the helpful things that that someone can say. Yeah, I think I touched a little bit on it, um, keeping things really open-ended, uh, expressing curiosity, um, tell me more, help me understand. I think are the absolute key pieces that you can keep in mind. You can't go wrong if you make an observation. Uh, if someone's crying, don't say you must be really upset say, I noticed that you were crying. I noticed that when your husband left, you got really quiet. I couldn't help but notice you were holding your side when I came in the room. 
those are great ways to start conversations because they're based on actual ob observation. They're tangible, they're fact. Um, and so there's no assumption there. It's something that you've witnessed and it, it just opens the door um, a little bit. Um, expressing your desire to be present. Um, let's take a moment. Is there something I can do for you in this moment that could be helpful? <laughs> Sometimes silence, which makes the majority of us really uncomfortable, <laughs> is actually a fantastic intervention. And it is absolutely okay to say, I don't know what to say. And people don't often get that. And, and as I said, you can leave here today, hopefully with some strategies or some ideas of what to say and what not to say. Um, but I'm a big believer. And if you don't know what to say, you don't have to say anything. And it's okay to call it out and be truthful. You know what, what you shared with me is so overwhelming. I really don't know how to answer that. It's okay if I just sit here with you for a while. Mm. Or I don't know what to say to that. Is there something I can say or do that might be helpful? That's okay. You are not expected to be the experts on communication or on oncology. Yeah, you're bringing up a really important point because some people just aren't comfortable or aren't, aren't big communicators you know are there are there other ways that we could for p people who aren't great communicators or struggle with knowing what to say are there other ways we can show that we care um asking that question again you know what can i do that could be helpful if you're a more tangible hands-on person uh whether it's delivering meals, whether it's offering to do pickups or drop-offs, those are more tangible, instrumental things. And keeping in mind that 7% of communication is actually what we say. Uh, the nonverbal <laughs> touch, hugs, sitting next to someone, those are all communicating something. Um, when I do presentations on communication, my favorite slide is the one that says, a person cannot not communicate. Just by being we're saying something, we're sharing something. And I think that um, for me has always been an important lesson is that if you don't have to be verbal, you don't have to be someone who's exquisite with your words, you can show caring in so many different other ways. And what if, uh, like what, what would be, I, I'm just trying to, to picture in my mind, you know, when you're, when somebody comes to you and, and they tell you that they have cancer, um, what's, what, could you give us maybe some techniques or, or suggestions of how we could just initiate that conversation? Um, like really some very good specifics, because I yeah. think a lot of people are genuinely anxious and, yeah. You know, they're, they might be loving and caring and, and, and even, you know, feeling empathy and compassion, but just are so darn afraid to mm -hmm. say the wrong thing that they, their response becomes more of a, a pushback. Yeah. So, you know, your question about how do you initiate the conversation? It's already been initiated if the person has just shared that diagnosis with you. So what they've actually done is started the conversation and they've opened the door because they have chosen to share that information with you. So now the key rests in how you respond, right? And I think that that's what you're asking. Um, and, and again, go with the curiosity um, and the thank you so much for sharing that information with me. And again, this is gonna be hard to tailor, but if you don't know what to say, because what happens in that moment is you're processing your own shock. So you need to keep that in mind. So a lot of the times the response ends up being about you. And I'm going a little bit into psychodynamic theory, but and, and less about the patient because you're, you're, you've received this information that's probably shocking, distressing, upsetting. And so now you're starting to feel something and your response is often based on that uh, and what you need to say or do and it might be to reassure the patient it might be to express shock um so if you really are feeling a lot of distress it's okay to go with what you're feeling i'm feeling really surprised again you can't go wrong if you're talking about yourself so it's okay to remove the focus for a second off the patient and say wow you know thanks for sharing that i'm feeling really shocked at this i'm feeling really sad to hear that i'm feeling i'm feeling not assuming you must be devastated this must be horrible. Oh my God, I'm feeling 
sad at hearing this. Mm -hmm. And you can also say, I'm not sure how to respond, but thank you for sharing. If you wanna talk about this later, I'm here for you. That's your presence. That often um, communicates presence, communicates understanding, and creates a sense of empathy because you're saying, I'm feeling something in response to what you've shared with me. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. I, you know, you keep bringing up the word empathy and, and how important that is. Um, and I guess empathy makes us also feel heard. Um, and, and once we start to feel heard, then it does open up the, the opportunity for the person to then continue that conversation, I would figure. Yeah. Often, you know, the distinction between sympathy and empathy um, comes up. You know, we, we all have the capacity to, to be sympathetic and that, you know, the difference being, I see your experience and I think it sucks. You know, I, I, I feel badly for you. Whereas empathy is I, I can feel what you're feeling. I can be in that emotion with you and connect on that level, that's empathy. Um, not that sympathy doesn't create a connection, but sympathy is more you're witnessing it and you're offering an observation or a sadness and emotion attached to that versus being empathetic with the person and actually sitting in that emotion and being present with the person. So it's a slight distinction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important one. Uh, in, you know, uh, in the world of in psychology, there's this terminology called uh, effective communication. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that with us? Yes. Um, so I think listening and hearing often get confused. Um, by default, we can all hear. We are equipped with ears. Um, so simply by hearing, we are receiving some information. That's not the same as listening. We can hear what a person is saying, but that doesn't mean we're processing it, understanding it, reflecting on it. Listening is the more conscious, active, and engaged process um, that we go through. And so effective communication cannot rely on, on just hearing alone. The active listening piece has to accompany it. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the words we say are 7%. 93% of communication is, is body language uh, and voice tone. So looking at the person, um, being completely focused, you know, you're not picking up your phone and checking and say, you know, tell me how your appointment was. Um, you're not multitasking. You're not checking your watch. You are in the moment. That is communicating so much. That leads to effective communication. Um, and people often don't realize just the slightest thing they do, a flicker of the eye away, sometimes indicates I'm, I'm not present. Um, tricks to effective communication to show that you're in the moment, often uh, things like validation and clarification. Uh, someone shares something with you. Am I understanding correctly that you're really worried? Um, it is a really good way of showing that you've heard what the person said and that you're giving it back to them um, and so they can validate and say, yeah, you know what, that's exactly how I'm feeling. Am I understanding correctly? And then they can kind of say, yes, oh no, hang on a second, you completely missed that. That's a, a, another, you're making some fantastic uh, points here. And, you know, because I think also, you know, the difference between hearing and listening is that we tend to hear something and then process it through our own frame of reference, our own life experiences, our own culture, our own background. And then we end up reacting accordingly. And, and I think as you were saying that if you are aware of that and cognizant enough um, and, and effective enough as a communicator, to just take that step back and ask the question instead of making the statement, um, it sounds like that would be a, a more effective way to communicate. And you just brought up a really important point, that of culture. Um, mm -hmm. We cannot underestimate how important the cultural lens is uh, in having 
any type of conversation um, with patients or with anyone in general, really, uh, that's again tied to our identity. And we talked about that at the beginning, how we filter things, how we understand and process things uh, is linked to our values, our beliefs, our past experience and the culture and context that we're immersed in. Uh, so that's a really important piece. Um, you know, in working in oncology, seeing a range of different multicultural families, every family wants something different. You've got their cultural context that might be related to ethnicity or background, and then you've got the family context. There's a culture in every family as well. Um, so that's an important piece as well. Some people want to talk and they will continue to talk. Others really, privacy is more valued. Things are kept a secret. Please don't ask me about my diagnosis. And if you do, I'm going to tell you that I'm feeling fine because I'm supposed to tell you that I'm feeling fine. And so that aspect is really important as well. So mm. don't underestimate uh, the cultural context or component. I'd like us to, to, to continue on that topic a little bit more as well. Um, specifically the point where you speak of, uh, you know, people culturally responding the way they're supposed to. Um, sometimes that's just also the way they've been um, brought up. They're more, uh, less open to express what they're truly experiencing, uh, which I would figure would make the conversation a little bit more difficult. Um, how could we get around that? So I think there's two parts to that. Um, the first is, do we need to get around that? If someone doesn't want to talk or share, is that okay? I think so. Um, and again, it, it can be very context driven. And, and that's where kind of, you know, my go to has always been follow the patient's lead. If they open a door, by all means, go through it uh, and, and respond. If they're saying the door's closed right now, that's, that's okay too. Uh, timing is everything. Um, and you need to be able to pay attention to what cues um, the patient or the person is giving you. And so, you know, the gift of presence can be silence or it can be, you know what, uh, I'm here when you need me to be. Go with the observation. I can see that you really don't want to talk about it right now and that's okay. When you need to, I'm ready to listen. You can always go back to the observation. I noticed that. Mm. I can see you don't want to talk about it. That's okay. You don't have to force a conversation. I think sometimes we feel a bit panicky and we feel that the only way to show compassion or to show that we're present is to do something, is to be able to be there. And the way to do that is to try to fix something. So please tell me what's wrong with you or what you need so I can feel better about this dynamic and I can fix something for you. That's that may or may not meet what the person wants. And it goes right back to tell me how I can be helpful. Tell me what you need in the moment. And that is the door opening or closing. If the door is closed, you're not going through it and you're not meant to kick it down. It's okay if it's closed. I love that you're making this point because I think there's a lot of pressure for people to continue to talk about how, what they're experiencing all the time. And yes, it, it you know it, it's helpful at the right time and at the right place, but not everybody has to be completely transparent with what they're experiencing, um, because they're probably still trying to to process it and and figure it out for themselves. So your point on timing is and and allowing people to come to you first, I think is is really really important in this conversation. There's a great research study, um, I'd have to go back and find it, that looks about mixed messages um, in oncology. And it looks at how the expectation or what happens is expectation to be open and to share, and then the expectation of avoidance. And they coexist. And so what this research study showed is that patients were struggling between the two. Do I want to avoid and pull away? Am I supposed to be open? Uh, and that created a lot of, this was looking at couples, a lot of uh, dis, um, uh, discomfort in the couple dynamic because they were giving given mixed messages of, you know what, avoid, pull back. You don't necessarily have to share versus no, 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 please tell me everything. Tell me everything, share with me. Uh, and so that, that was quite confusing for patients. Uh, but the research actually shows that, you know, is one better than the other? A patient, can they choose to avoid? Of course they can. 
maybe we need to talk a little bit more about um, people's discomfort because there might be a, a thin line between uh, the, the, the person who's going through something interpreting uh, uh, interpreting the behavior as avoidant behavior, as I just don't want to talk about this and what you're going through is not important, versus uh, the person just feeling really uncomfortable having the conversation. Yeah. And that goes right back to tell me what you need um, in the moment. If you're uncomfortable talking about it, it's okay to say that. And I think it would be better received to say that than to say something harmful, uh, than to say the wrong thing uh, because of your panic or your discomfort. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, uh, Debbie, your question is, can it be misinterpreted when someone doesn't wanna talk about something? Um, mm -hmm. And again, it depends if the patient's opened the door and said, oh my gosh, you know, I got this diagnosis or this is happening and I'm feeling a lot of distress. The person receiving the message can obviously respond in different ways. One could be, oh, wow, you're feeling a lot of distress. Tell me more about that. Help me understand what you're going through. One way could be, wow, you're going through a lot of distress. Um, I, I really feel sad for you, or, but I, I don't know what to say in that moment. So acknowledging that or, wow, you know, you're feeling a lot of distress. Thank you for sharing uh, that with me. What can I do to help you mm -hmm. with that distress? So again, different ways you can respond, but it's going to be based on your own comfort level. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no, no wrong way. I mean, I could probably list some wrong ways, but, but what I'm saying is however you respond is going to be okay for you. As mm -hmm. long as you're aware uh, of what happens to you, you have to keep in mind your own response. Uh, which I, I brought up earlier, because what's actually happening is you're responding to you. You're not necessarily responding to the person right away. The first thing that happens is in you and your response is based on that. And so you need to be aware of what's coming up for you. Mm -hmm. And what about from the perspective of the, of, of the person who's experiencing the cancer? Um, sometimes they could be seeing this their loved one move away or not ask questions or not approach them and be interpreting that as they don't care. Uh, how could the actual person who's experiencing cancer maybe help their friends and family to be open to them and have that conversation with them? Yeah, it's opening the door. Uh, it's saying, you know, I'm feeling this can we talk about it? Or I'd really like to share this with you. Um, the research actually shows that family members experience higher rates of anxiety, distress, and depression than the actual cancer patient. Um, and that's a really important statistic. Um, I'm a big believer in, in family systems theory. There's a reason I'm a, I'm a family therapist. The cancer diagnosis, it impacts the entire family. So everyone in the family is going to be struggling with the impact, uh, their own responses and how to talk about it or not talk about it. Um, so for the patient to open the door, that's, that's the key piece um, to be able to say, I'd like to talk about it. Now how the person responds again is based on all the other things that we, we talked about earlier. The other thing that I, that I want to mention, um, and I'm a big believer obviously in therapy, but in, you know, if there's an infail me people or, but if there's a healthcare team around the diagnosis is to ask those questions. I would often hear in psychosocial oncology, I don't know how to bring this up with him. I'm afraid of hurting his feelings. I'm afraid she'll think that I feel that I'm a burden. And so there are all these things um, that you don't want to share or you don't know how to. And then sometimes it's not a bad idea to look for support externally. And you know, I started off by saying, when you asked me, why do I think communication is so important? Because what's unsaid can lead to distress, regret, confusion. Um, and, and that's a key piece. So how do I say the things that I can't say um, is, is an important aspect with these difficult conversations. And, and how, how do you say the things that you can't say? Yeah, good therapist. Um, no, well, I think 
first of all is timing and judging openness. Oftentimes, as you said, avoidance can be misinterpreted. And that's because of the other person's distress, shock, uh, inability, or, or their fear of their inability to support the patient. And so how do you share that? It's saying what you actually feel. I feel this. It goes back to the I statements that I started. Not, you never spend time with me. You never support me. You seem to be avoiding me. It's the I. I feel this when you, I feel scared. I feel, if you go with the emotion, um, that really opens up the door and allows the other person to respond to that. Now, I'm not saying the other person can, will necessarily respond in a favorable way. They may not know how to respond. And that's why we're having this, this talk so that maybe they can have the skills to respond to the I feel statement. You know, thank you for sharing that with me. And then I don't know what to do with this or how can I be helpful or they can walk through the door uh, and have a conversation with the person. Mm -hmm. I think also what might be happening is, uh, you know, if if the 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 support person um, or the caregiver or the family member might be experiencing this, uh, I need to be brave. Mm -hmm. You know, or as you as you touched on a little bit earlier, which I would love us to talk a little bit more on. You know, um, I'm just going to be happy. I'm just going to I'm just going to keep talking about, you know, how things are going to be okay and, and that you need to be positive and, and you can't let this negative toxicity and, you know, enter into your, in, into you, or you're going to get sicker. Um, and, and kind of close that conversation. Uh, are there some hints that you can give us that can help us to, to deal with that kind of reaction? Yeah. Um, so what you're saying is that the conversation is too difficult um, for the caregiver to engage in, is that? Yes, exactly. Okay. exactly. Um, so there's uh, these three W's that we, we talk about when we, when we teach our, our course on difficult conversations and it's wish, worry, wonder. Um, and so this idea of, you know, I wish everything would be okay. I worry though, that maybe you might get a little sicker. I wonder if we could talk about it. For the patient, uh, maybe I should have clarified that to, to say to a super positive family member who doesn't want to engage, uh, who's really on you know, this, everything's going to be okay about my And the patient is feeling like, no, it's not. Or I really need to tell you that I feel crappy. Or I really need to tell you that I'm scared. Um, the wish, worry, wonder uh, is really a fantastic tool and effective, again, you know, in different realms. But uh, I wish that I stayed as healthy. Or I wish that I, you know, feel this good all the time. I worry, though. That things may change. I worry if I may get a little bit sicker. I wonder if we could talk about if that happens. So what you do is you keep the hope piece and the positive there. I wish. So there's an aspect of the future. There's the worry piece. That's really important that you're inserting there as well. And the wonder is the curiosity or the question, can we at least talk about it? And so it kind of brings all these elements uh, in together um, and makes those difficult conversations um, a little bit easier. We only have maybe five more minutes of, of our talking and then we'll shoot it over to questions. So if anybody has some short questions that you wanna put into the chat, please put it into the chat uh, now and I'll try to get to them. Um, Anita, the, one of the other questions I wanted to talk about was, um, can, maybe, can you maybe talk about how the conversation could get a little bit more difficult depending on the person's um, diagnosis or prognosis and how as a loving supportive family member um, can we be even show even more support even more support um, so my hope is as a loving family member that they've you know you've kind of been present um, from the beginning and, and I guess I'm a bit stuck on the more support part of the question, but you know, overall, the support should meet the needs of the patient or the person. And so what might happen is the quantity of support 
um, doesn't necessarily change. It's the quality of what or what the patient needs that actually changes. So how you support the patient over time will change. Uh, and that's often when, you know, what we see when we look at graphs of caregiving and sort of what the needs are at the beginning from, um, you know, driving the patient around and making appointments to more hands-on care. And so there's a trajectory um, that, that, you know, we could talk about if we had more time uh, of what caregivers actually do and what patients need and, and do they match or not. So I think, you know, because we're talking about communication, the way to best know what the patient needs is to ask the question. Uh, our hope is always that patients can articulate, I need this. It would be helpful if, can you kindly do some patients can, and that's fantastic. Others may or may not. And then that goes to the caregiver then. How can I be helpful? I couldn't help but notice that you were struggling with this, or I couldn't help but notice that this morning, uh, is that something I can help with? Um, and so again, communication, and maybe this is the you know key point to emphasize, there's reciprocity, right? The message that you intend to send needs to land in the way that you intended it. And maybe that answers your question of what's effective communication. It's not just saying the words in this beautiful packaged way and giving it to someone. It's how the recipient takes that message. And if the intent of your message is clear, then that's effective uh, communication. And I always go back to intent. Um, often when there's conflict, the intent can be good. If it doesn't land correctly, or if the perception of what the intent was doesn't match, then then that wasn't effective communication, even if you followed all these great strategies that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, you, you absolutely did. Um, and I think that if you, we're all gonna say something wrong at some point, you know, particularly when we get anxious or nervous, um, But there are things we can do right afterwards once we get that 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 notion of oof i shouldn't have said that uh could you maybe talk a little bit on that i think you just said it oof i shouldn't have said that <laughs> that that's okay i'm sorry i didn't know what to say or i can see what i said upset you i'm sorry again it's okay to be humble there is no expectation that myself included we are experts uh, on communicating or that we know exactly what to say in a moment. And again, saying the wrong thing is often on you. It's based on your response. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's an important piece to keep in mind. And so I think being humble and saying, I'm sorry, is fine. I didn't know what to say. Uh, or going again with the observation, I noticed that what I said upset you. I'm sorry, that was not my intent. It goes back to intent. My intent was, and then you can rephrase it. And you can even say, you know what, hang on, let me rephrase that. That's okay. That's, a, I think, a perfect way for us to, to end before we give a little summary. I'll look over and see some of the questions that we have that's come up. Uh, one question is, uh, if a friend is going for treatment, is it okay to phone them and ask them how things went? Or is that inappropriate? depends on their relationship with the friend and if they've been keeping in touch with you and saying hey I'm going for my appointment then they've disclosed the information to you then yes then you have that kind of dynamic to be able to say hey uh, you mentioned you were going for your appointment I'm just checking in I'm just checking in is different than how is the appointment uh, and, and again it's a fine distinction because you're not asking for details now there's so many other factors that are involved you know the relationship with the person how much you're already sharing if you keep it general enough, it gives them the power or the control to choose how much they want to share. If you say, how was the appointment? Tell me about the appointment. Then they're a blot. They, they will feel the pressure or the obligation. You may notice that if the appointment went crappy, they may not be answering you. And then you're thinking, oh my God, should I have texted? I shouldn't have texted. Oh, it didn't go well, right? So instead, you don't pose it as a question. You can say, just checking in, hope things went well. Let me know if you need anything. Again, very subtle distinction between asking the question, but what I imagine you want to do is convey that you care. And you can do that without it having being a question, without putting pressure on the other person to respond. That's often what we do by accident is we put pressure on the other person. If they just had chemotherapy or they're feeling crap, they may or may not want to answer you. Uh, or they may feel the pressure to answer you because they don't want you to worry. And that's not fair. So you can convey compassion and, and curiosity and say, hey, just checking in, just thought about you. You need anything, I'm here. And that's enough. 
Um, but again, that's a very general answer because it, it totally depends on, on the degree uh, of closeness in the relationship and, and if the person has been communicating after all their appointments, then of course it's okay. So kind of a backdoor answer. Okay, we have another question here. What do you do or say when the patient is always complaining about everything? That's a therapy session. Um, <laughs> why do people complain? Okay, it's not interactive. I have to answer that one. Okay, so hang on. So why do people complain? Um, because they're distressed, because they want to be heard. They're unhappy. A need isn't being met. Uh, and that's a short list. Um, and so I imagine the questions being asked because it's frustrating to hear someone complaining all the time. Go to the validation piece or the observation piece. I can't help but notice that you seem to be quite upset about quite a lot of things. Is there anything that I can do to help? That's it. They want validation. They want to be heard. Sometimes it's just to be able to say that. They're not actually looking for you to be able to fix things. It becomes annoying or frustrating because I imagine there's this wondering of, am I supposed to fix this? Uh, is there something I'm supposed to do here with all this complaining? It may or may not be the case. But the complaining is about the patient. And let's not forget that that experience is tied to distress. It's tied to frustration and it's tied to loss of control. The complaining about things not being done for them or done in a way that meets their needs is because they've lost control. Uh, and, and I could just spend so much more time talking about that, but I'm hoping that helps taper your distress response or your frustration response or your anger response when all you feel you hear is complaints. And I get it. Um, the majority of my work is done with family caregivers. And, and so that is a very real experience um, is that frustration of never being able to do enough. It doesn't matter what I do, it's just not enough. Um, but there's a reason that the patient's expressing those thoughts or those feelings. Um, and, I, and I wish I had more time to do that. So all I'm saying is maybe throw some empathy and compassion into the frustration and maybe it might make it more tolerable. I don't know if that, that was, that was a, beautiful, a beautiful response. So we're, we're coming to the last minute or two. Um, and Anita, I wanted to give you an opportunity to summarize um, the key points for us so that they can get stuck into, into our memories. I think the key piece is it's okay to not know what to say, to be humble in that fact and to be able to acknowledge that, that to recognize that the verbal is only 7%, then your, that your presence, your tone, your touch, that's 93% of communication. Uh, and that's a really important piece. If you go in with curiosity and kindness and ask open-ended questions, tell me more, help me understand, that lands much gentler than assumptions, um, than going in as the expert, than using relativity theory. I've seen this, I read this, I felt this, I needed this. Um, because then you take away that person's experience and you try to make it your own, even if the intent is good. Um, and never be afraid to say, I'm sorry, because we're all going to mess up and that's okay. You're not leaving here experts on communication. I'm sorry, I'm not that good, but I hope you're leaving here with some insight uh, into what might work uh, and, and what definitely will not. That's my summary. So it's empathy, validate, notice, express kindness curiosity yeah. and humility. Yeah, I think so. And, and ear, you know, um, empathy, assertiveness and respect. I mean, you could probably Google that. There's research on that. Those are key elements of communication and the wish, worry, wonder um, really is a nice framework um, that you can use as well. That's wonderful. Well, Anita, thank you for, for sharing your wisdom with us this evening. Uh, it was an absolute honor to to have this discussion with you. And thank you to everybody who sat with us for the hour. Uh, I see that uh, you're getting some some accolades and some thank yous from uh, from some of our participants here. I wish you all a, a safe drive or safe evening and um, a very nice good night. Thank you, Anita, again.
pleasure. <laughs>